Welcome. My name is Stephen Sanet. I'm an American osteopathic physician, and I'd like to talk to you about basic visceral manipulation theory as it relates to osteopathic medicine. The concepts that we'll be using in visceral manipulation are two very different ideas. One is mobility and one is motility. Mobility is the gross movement of the viscera as it relates to diaphragmatic motion. As the diaphragm goes up and down, it changes pressures, it forces organs to move along each other. Motility is a very different idea. It is the inherent motion of the viscera as it relates to its embryologic unfolding and development. And there is a lot of confusion between these two ideas. Mobility doesn't require any sort of belief system in this theory. Uh, it requires motion. Motility requires you to palpate something that there's quite a bit of conjecture about as to whether or not you're able to palpate this rhythm. So in my personal experience, some people have um, found visceral manipulation not useful because they cannot feel the motility. What I'm telling you is if you can feel the motility, you'll have additional options open to you. If you can't feel this subtle rhythm that people talk about, that has not been proven in a scientific way, if you cannot feel the motility, you can still apply uh, mobility techniques and have results. Mobility is proven. Motility is a theory. So I'm gonna start out with this idea of, I'm gonna go back and forth between these two different ideas. When we talk about a visceral rhythm, saying that an organ goes through a particular type of motion, we're talking about something that is on the order of less than 500 microns per cycle. To my knowledge, it hasn't been um, adequately proved in any scientific way that this rhythm exists. There are those of us who do motility, we feel this rhythm and it is, um, it seems to be an echo of the embryology of the body's unfolding of the organs. There are other rhythms that we use in medicine for sure that we absolutely do scientifically know. There's a cardiac rhythm and I'm just giving you general, general rates here, general normal rates. So cardiac rhythm, we use in all kinds of medicine, respiratory rhythm, uh, we recognize in traditional medicine. When we talk about cranial rhythm and visceral rhythm, to my knowledge, these, not have been, these have not been adequately proved in any scientific way, yet there are those of us who use these motilities inherent motion of the cranial system, inherent motion of the visceral system, and we've used them with some efficacy. So I just want to open the discussion with that idea to leave your mind open to the possibility that there are other rhythms um, that people have difficulty with. What I did in this diagram, this is just arbitrary. I just made this up. It's not meant to be accurate or to scale necessarily. What I'm showing here is a cardiac rhythm is this black rhythm, and it's going very fast. Going slower than that would be a respiratory rhythm, breath in and breath out. Going slower than that, following cranial theory would be this red rhythm, and the slowest going about six to eight cycles per minute would be a visceral rhythm. My uh, point in showing you this diagram is that these rhythms are, they're all happening at the same time. Now the cardiac rhythm, the cranial rhythm, and the respiratory rhythm, black, uh, blue, and red are global rhythms happening throughout the whole body. Whereas this green visceral rhythm per se, if this was the liver we're talking about, this is a rhythm coming only from the, from the liver. It's not a global sort of thing. Um, and I've already started to allude to that on the previous slide. So cardiac respiratory cranial rhythms, the heart um, has a beat, and that beat is palpable in various arteries all throughout the whole body. Uh, respiration, you take a big breath in, your rib cage expands, the paired bones externally rotate. We can observe this throughout the entire body. And that theory also holds with cranial rhythm. For those that feel that motility, it is palpable through the whole body. Visceral rhythm, and uh, the current way of looking at it is organ specific. So there's different rhythms happening all at the same time. I'll speak about the motility first. The theory of motility is that what we're feeling is a very subtle, small excursion palpation. 
that is mirroring the embryologic axes of the unfolding of the organ. And we have certain terminologies that we use to describe this. So what I'm showing here in this blue arrow is the liver going through what we would call um, expir, meaning that it's moving towards the median axis. And it does this, it does this in three planes of motion. So a cycle of visceral motility would be moving toward the axis in expir, moving away from the axis in inspir. That would be a cycle of one. Okay, so our normal um, exper experience of this is six to eight cycles per minute for a visceral rhythm. Uh, unfortunately, these are the popular terms, expir and inspir. And I say unfortunately because it creates confusion. People are wanting to compare this to inspiration, the English word, and expiration, the English word. And there's no connection between that. This has nothing to do with that diaphragmatic movement. This has to do with movement of a very small order, less than 500 microns per cycle, happening in the liver only. As a rhythm, we could describe it with qualities of rate, how fast it's going, and amplitude how strong that feeling is to us. There are some different tools that we use in visceral manipulation. One is a global listening tool looking for a key lesion that will not be discussed in this lecture. Uh, the most useful tool in basic visceral manip manipulation is the local listening tool. And that's a method for finding abnormalities and disruptions within a region. And you'll hear me speak about global, regional, and local. Global is something that we believe is disturbing many things across many planes in the body. Local, or I'm sorry, regional would be a region. And for instance, here we can say the region of the thorax or the region of the abdomen. Finding a lesion that will um, at least disturb things regionally. And then we can look at uh, local, very site-specific things. That's what we will discuss um, in this lecture, um, only superficially. I'll spend more time speaking about mobility in this lecture. Another uh, diagnostic tool within the body of visceral manipulation is thermal evaluation, feeling areas where there are um, thermal differences. And those thermal differences can be hot or cold. Um, that's all I will say about it in this in this lecture. Now let's talk about mobility, gross motion that is happening because the diaphragm is moving. What kind of things are going to affect gross motion? Well, there's an intracavitary pressure. So in the thorax, you have a uh, alternating negative and positive pressure area. In the abdomen, the pressure is greater, positive pressure in the pelvis, it's even greater. And in the skull, you have positive pressure also, but not like you do in the abdomen and the pelvis. So the intracavitary pressure, that's going to be something that affects mobility, gross motion. Respiration, that's going to affect mobility, a person's ability uh, to take in a proper tidal volume. And articulations. Um, articulations, traditionally, when we think about manipulation, we think about uh, bones moving. Uh, they're articulating with one another. In the same way that we think of bones moving against each other, we can talk about normal and abnormal articulations uh, for the viscera. The viscera have certain ways that they should or shouldn't move. I'm going to restrict my conversation mostly to the abdomen and somewhat to the pelvis in this, um, this uh, beginning lecture. So things that are going to affect uh, normal motion in the, uh, in the abdomen, particularly the abdomen and in the pelvis will be a double layer system of peritoneum that has about 60 cc's of fluid between the layers that normally allows things to move. There's a ligamentous system. I will mention again, when we traditionally think about ligaments, we're thinking about something that attaches bone to bone. In this case, we're talking about fascial systems of support within the abdomen. There's a normal tonicity that should be there that can be altered under certain situations. Turgor. Turgor is your um, 
your dry, how dry you are or how wet you are. We would say as a as more of a slang in medicine, we'd say someone is wet or dry, meaning that they are either not retaining fluids or they're retaining too much fluid. This is going to affect the intracavitary pressure and normal motion. Other big things responsible for movement in the abdomen would be the uh, mesenteric system, which suspends many things, and the omental system, which uh, does quite a bit of lubrication and has other functions as well, um, as far as energy storage, and it has some uh, protection against infections, but that's all I'll say about that now. So if things can move normally, then what can restrict things from moving normally? Well, you can have adhesions. How do you get adhesions? You get adhesions from infection. You get them from trauma. Uh, you get them iatrogenically. Uh, it could be caused by a normal surgery that you had with a normal consequence of surgery. Uh, things may be sticking to other things. These are the kinds of things in traditional medicine, someone who has a surgery, surgery went well, and then they have abdominal pain every time they eat. They go back to the surgeon and say, what's wrong? Surgeon evaluates you and says, well, you're fine. From a traditional medical viewpoint, fine means you had something requiring surgery, we did surgery, you healed without an infection, and therefore you're normal. And what I mean by that is that in traditional medicine, they're not looking for tissues that are sticking to each other. That's not a particular finding. Um, that they're going to be concerned about. The surgeon will be concerned about, did the surgery go well? Did you heal after the surgery? Um, one loop of bowel sticking to another loop of bowel, things like this that might cause you pain while eating, they're not, for the most part, aware of that. Other types of restrictions are ligamentous laxities, or we call it ptosis, uh, from people that are grossly overweight or other traumas, other disease states that have caused the organs to not be held in the place where they're normally held, we call it first, second, and third degree ptosis. In a first degree ptosis, this might be changed by visceral mobility techniques. Second and third degree, unlikely to change that ptosis, but you may be able to address the symptoms. And the last major category of motion restriction would be viscerous spasms. Um, caused by, again, can be caused by trauma, can be caused by infection uh, and other disease states, uh, cholecystitis, appendicitis, um, things like this can cause things to spasm and their motion becomes restricted. What are our goals uh, for visceral, for visceral manipulation? Our goals and our contraindications, our goals are are simple. We want to get things moving better for the for most of our manipulators. We want to get things moving better so that they uh, get more restored to normal, or we want to move normal things to override an inappropriate neurological stimulus. And I will explain more into that in the next few slides. Um, so rather than think for contraindication, who are you not going to do mobility to? I would relate it to pressure. So for those of you who are doing myofascial release or other types of techniques where you're putting pressure, pressure can be done mild, can be done moderate, can be done extreme. So the contraindications would be who aren't you going to use heavy or moderate pressure on? I am not, um, I am not asking people to step outside their level of licensure. So if you're not a physician, I do not want to tell you how you're going to evaluate them for things that will be contraindicated because if it is not within your scope of practice, there's no way that you could know. And it would be more dangerous for you to try and take the place of their physician if you're not responsible for those diagnoses. So if you go out on Google and look at what are contraindications or you look in uh, many books, you will see uh, abdominal aneurysm, uh, metastatic cancer, um, uh, other edematous conditions that they will give you uh, contraindications about. They will say hepatomegaly, they'll say splenomegaly. I'm going to put this all in the category of your level of licensure. 
So I am a physician. If someone has an enlarged spleen, I am supposed to know that. If you are someone who is not responsible for making that diagnosis of splenomegaly, if you're a physical therapist, you're not responsible for making that diagnosis. Their physician is. However, you have an ethical obligation. So if you have a patient that comes in that feels far normal from what you're used to feeling in the abdomen and you're not sure, uh, my answer to you is refer them to their physician and say, can I use heavy pressure in their abdomen? Can I use moderate pressure in their abdomen? Physician says, no, then don't do it. Physician says, yeah, you can do that. Then you're cleared. So that's what you do in this gray area. And in my opinion, many people that are doing visceral manipulation today are being taught to uh, supplant the physician and that's very dangerous. So again, if your licensing includes diagnosing an abdominal aneurysm, then you have to be responsible for it. If it doesn't, you have an ethical responsibility to say, this doesn't feel right to me. Let their doctor check it out. So that's a broad category and a safe way to practice mobility, which involves mild, moderate, or significant pressures. Motility, this is, motility is you using less than the weight of your hand to palpate what is theorized 500 millimeters of motion, or some people theorize that this is an energetic palpation. So for that type of motility, this is not contraindicated unless you cannot put any pressure on their skin. What are the goals? Your goals are either to restore normal mobility where there isn't normal mobility or to override aberrant neurological signals with normal organ motion. I'm going to conclude here for part one of visceral theory and continue on the next video. Thank you for your attention. And if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. Thank you.